You know, I actually would say this more of as a general statement. I think um, just with working with people in general, something that I've experienced on my own and something I appreciate have appreciated as a as an employee or even in a meeting where I'm talking to a client or really any situation is just to be listened to. I feel like most most employees want to be heard. Um, and I think most people want to be heard in general. And, you know, designers are artists at heart, you know, we're, we're artists. And so we have a point of view and, you know, when you hire a designer to do a job, they're, they're coming at it with their entire heart in that job because art is our passion and that's Mm -hmm. why we do what we do. So, um, I think that I would say one of the things I think is important in leading a creative team and just leading people in general is just to listen to their point of view because they're, they're trying to, you hire them to do a job for you. And if you don't trust their point of view or are not even willing to listen to what they have to say, why did you hire them in the first place? Because you're hiring them to do this job and to give, to give back to the company. So I think that's a small thing that you can do to to just make people feel like they're appreciated and that they have a say in building in building the company with you because they are you know I think that's a fantastic point about recognizing that creatives and artistic types Mm -hmm. they are bringing their passion every day and that's what you're hiring them to do that's what you're bringing them in to do as someone with an engineering background, I could kind of phone it in on the passion every day because <laughs> the numbers on the spreadsheet are the numbers on the spreadsheet, right? Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't have to bring. Do you make a pretty spreadsheet? I do make a pretty spreadsheet. <laughs> I have some examples for you if you want to see. Um, but uh, yeah, it's you know th- there are a lot of jobs where you don't. Your passion doesn't have to be up at that level, but if you're an artist, your passion is up at that level. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. that's, that's what, and we want to encourage that. So that's yeah, for awesome. sure. You get your best work, I think, out of people when they are passionate about what they're working on, right? Yeah. So like you might be not have your passion up to here for the spreadsheet, but whatever the spreadsheet means, you're putting your passion yeah. into that, right? Finding meaning in your work, yeah. which is, which, which I never had a hard time doing. Right. So. so, yeah. So I guess that's a, actually a call back to the last question too. Like, I hope like that's something I'm able to bring to, to the team is to help them find meaning in what we're doing and. Right. I've always stuck with that idea. That's fantastic. And one of the things I see entrepreneurs often doing, often trying to do, because entrepreneurs are smart, talented, driven people, is when they aren't good at something, they will try to learn how to do it. Hmm. And that that's good in the beginning. It's important to learn things in the beginning. But there's a really important point as an entrepreneur where you have to recognize where your time is more is more valuably spent. Right. And so you are perfectly capable as an entrepreneur of learning some of these things, the marketing but is that the best use of your time? And a lot of entrepreneurs go through that of having to, to go through the growing pains a little bit of, well, I'm a smart guy or gal, I can learn how to do this. And then saying, you know what? Not the best use of my time. And it sounds like right. you've already crossed that bridge. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, I have a few thoughts on that that I found very useful. Um, one of them is I did management, uh, I, I, I studied management at Harvard. And one of the things they teach about Harvard is that it's all about process. Uh, don't think about management as having to figure out people's personalities and being responsible for their, you know, uh, limitations or, or concerns or challenges. No, no. They teach that if you set up a, a bunch of processes through which they're set up to succeed, mm-hmm. then you've done your job, right? And so to me, being an entrepreneur, you're, you're, it's a process of setting up each department, each piece of your business if you sort of do a deep dive in each thing, like marketing, I did a deep dive into marketing, came up with a whole plan, what are all the places we can market, uh, how can we set up each one, I started setting up each one, and then I hired somebody who's an expert mm-hmm. at it, got them set up and equipped so that they're starting to, to run with it. Once, once I feel like that is off and running, that one system, now I can move my focus to the next system, yeah. right? So it's just basically setting up processes for each thing Rather than going nuts doing all these thousands of things, I can dive into one at a time. That's awesome. Which I yeah. find to be useful. It's, it's very similar to how we approach things in the, in the United States Air Force. Hmm. Um, we're always looking to set people up for success 
right? Have that, whether it's a process, whether it's inputs, whether it's a team around them, whatever it is, set, set that person up for success and not just for the tasks they're gonna do or their job they're doing today, but how are we setting them up for success in their career later on? How are we giving them leadership development, career development, personal development, so that they will, they will be able to set other people up for success in the future? Nice, oh, that's great. It reminds me of my absolute favorite uh, quote about delegation. They say, set, oh, they say, give your people as much freedom as possible without setting them up to fail. And for, I, I just, that to me encapsulates delegation in one sentence. Have you found, as an entrepreneur, have you found delegation to your team hard? You, you come from a, hmm. a background with a little more leadership development than some already have when they get into entrepreneurship. So maybe you've got that locked down. But I have found that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with delegation. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is you always feel like you could do it better. Right. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the absolute, you know, that's the impulse that you absolutely have to try to avoid. Yeah. Um, I like to think that my job is to get the results through my team rather than to do it myself. Right. Because I absolutely have that urge to just dive in. I can do it better. Let me just do it. But and you've got to stay focused on 1000 locations. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The big picture. Right. If I get lost in the weeds of doing little things, then I'm not building those systems, those processes. Mm -hmm. I'm not setting other people up to succeed. All the things we just talked about, I'm not getting in the way of that if I'm not delegating and trying to achieve results through people. So what's your approach to delegation? Any advice hmm. for entrepreneurs out there? That quote I just said is the biggest one, hmm. right? Give people as much freedom as possible without setting them up to fail. And that second part I think is worth unpacking a bit without setting them up to fail. You have to have a bit of an instinct to know if I just let them run with this, are they gonna succeed at it or mm -hmm. not? And if not, what can I do to help them succeed at it, Yeah. right? Um, like one little simple practical technique is when somebody's struggling, I try not to take on their problems. I try not to mm -hmm. say, oh, I'll make that phone call or, or I'll take care of that for you. I try instead, first ask them, what do they think is the solution? Because nine times out of 10, the thing they say that they think is the solution is very clearly the solution. Mm -hmm. They just need, somebody to say, that's right, you're on it, go do that. So, sounds great to me, go, go forth and do great things. Right. And, and those, we call them vector checks. Uh, I mentioned earlier, when you're delegating, you wanna give people as much freedom as possible without setting them up to fail. But all the people around you, people who are at the same level or when you're managing up, you're always trying to help them to succeed and looking for ways that you can help them to succeed, right? Thinking, I don't know, I can't think of an example of it, but you know, I'm, I'm always, when I'm thinking of my boss, I'm thinking, how can I equip this person to succeed at their role? I, I believe the same thing. And uh, I'm glad you brought up managing up because it's not something we talk a lot about with our, with our guests when we interview mm -hmm. them, but it's so important um, either as a, an entrepreneur, as a founder to make sure that your people, the people on your team know they can manage up a little bit. One of the things I learned in the air force and it didn't always make me popular with my bosses, but it, I think it helped my bosses out, my commanders out in the long run is, have you heard the saying bad news doesn't get better with age? I don't think I have heard that. Okay, we'll, but we'll put that sense, one on the right? whiteboard. You wanna tell them real fast, immediately. That, yeah, uh, and that, that was always my philosophy is, I owe it to my commander, I owe it to my boss to tell them what's going on and how I'm trying to fix it, not just pointing out problems. Right. But if we have a problem, I owe it to them to either tell them we've got this problem and I can't fix it on my own, or we have this problem and I did fix it and here's how, or buckle up, here it comes, right. so that they're prepared mm -hmm. and they can do things at their level back to setting everybody up for success right. later on. Didn't make me very popular all the time, <laughs> but in the, en in, in the end, I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, that's, it's funny, I've run into that where I'm trying to give people the news ASAP so we as a team can collectively uh, work on it. And uh, I've yet to find the magic in every scenario of how to not be shot as the messenger. <laughs> But I still just yeah. still believe you've, you've got to uncover that as soon as possible because I'm trying to get the team to succeed. Yeah. Right. That's my number one focus. Myself is second. Right. Team succeeding is number one. And managing up is definitely a key part of that. Um, you actually just gave me a new idea, which I've never really thought about. How do you manage up and work with your manager to be managing down so that it's sort of a, a, a cycle between the two of you? If you're you know, transparent and, and authentic about the fact that you're managing up, mm -hmm. it might actually open up some dialogue where the two of you are actually working together. A actually right? building a relationship of trust between two people. 
<laughs> what a concept, can you imagine? right? Can you imagine? <laughs> nice. And and that's exactly the, the the answer I think to your to your self imposed question is, you know, as either as the boss, come come in and talk to me. Let's let's talk. What's going on? What right. are you struggling with? How can I help you? Have you thought about this? Good talk. Let's do this again in about a week or two weeks, right? right? And as a as a an employee, as a subordinate, it's a little harder. But if you've got a, a boss that you need to build that relationship with trust with, hey, can I come in and talk to you about some things? Right. Yeah, good, nice. Good talk. Can we do this again in about a week? That's the key, right? That's uh, Coming back to process I mentioned earlier, right there you're setting up a process where we just know every week or two that we're going to have a, a heart-to-heart this, conversation. This is the relationship that every commander and director of operations at a squadron level in the Air Force has to have. The director of operations is second in command of a squadron. So I was that to a commander in Colorado. And this is the relationship we developed. And it's the relationship that, that any two closely working closely working people have to have. Nice. I want to, before yeah. we move on to something else, because I'm, sure. so, I'm so captivated by your story as a drill instructor for at risk youth, and you mentioned that one of the things you would get called to do is when a kid wants to quit, yeah. you'd be the one who they'd call to come talk to them. Yeah. And, and I want to know, what did you learn from that experience about trying to keep at-risk kids in this program? How does that help you with entrepreneurs at Bunker Labs, veteran entrepreneurs, mill spouse entrepreneurs at Bunker Labs, because their days as an entrepreneur, sometimes you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, well, I, the, it was a very personal way that I did that. I had, I had kind of a retention speech, right? But I also, there was a point in my life where um, I was going through some really hard adversities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember it's just like, it's just this little miracle piece of paper that somebody gave me. And it was this poem. Mm -hmm. And the poem was called Man in the Glass. And I'll probably paraphrase this. You've probably seen memes on it and stuff like that. But um, Dale Wimbro is the guy who wrote it. And it's basically, it's you, it's the man in the glass is the man in the mirror. Yeah. And the whole preface of it is like, you, you know, you've cheated. Um, nobody's verdict matters. Nobody's opinion matters. Um, but you're going to live a horrible life if you've cheated the man in the glass. Yeah. Then what I would do is I would ask all the questions, right? And try to understand where they were coming from. Sometimes they got a letter from back home that upset them and they were just trying to make a, a very emotional decision. But I would always have them in my office and I had that, that uh, poem hanging up. And I would make that, after I was done talking to them and I'd make them you know, wait until their platoon sergeant would come back and get them, I would have them turn around and face the wall just far enough away that mm -hmm. it's not right in front of their face but I would make them face the wall until their platoon sergeant got there. And then they'd all just kind of get distracted and then they'd look and they'd see that. And I'd notice them kind of read it. And I, I would say eight out of 10 times, they would turn back around, request permission to speak, balling and just yeah. request to go back and get back to work. So I tried to put that perspective on, on mm. them and um, I, I just want to share, this is a little bit of an offshoot, but it's really important because years later when I was, uh, when I was growing the DJ business, I remember where I was at cause it was in Tulsa. I had opened up the first office down in Dallas mm -hmm. and that was the biggest thing that I'd ever done at that time. Like outside of the, my days in the, as the drill instructor. And I re I was like trying to scale and duplicate that whole operation. I was recruiting my own people. I was doing all that stuff. And this was when Facebook was kind of mm -hmm. really getting uh, big. It was like 2011, right? 2012. And I got a message from a kid and he said, Hey, my name's Justin. You probably don't remember me. I was trying to quit one day and I read this poem that you had on your wall. And he said, I just wanted you to know that changed my life. And now I'm in the air force. I just, I just picked up E4 uh, and I'm starting to lead people. And I think about that day every day. And then I was, just, it was just this big, like, it was this big aha for me. And it's like, I know that I needed to keep doing that in some way, shape or form. Uh, and that's where I just, I kept reading. I kept learning. I kept trying to grow everything with way more integrity than just, you know, a list of uh, a checklist of to do items mm -hmm. uh, and calling that scale. Right. I wanted, I wanted to, everything that I've touched since then, I wanted it to have more meaning, more purpose. Um, and for lack of a better term, getting customers in any business is important, 
but I think everybody should have two lines out the door. It's a line of people that can't wait to buy what you have mm -hmm. and a line of people that can't wait to be part of your team. And, and I try to bake that into everything that I do, whether it be the voluntary stuff, um, all the organizations. And I think about that, that note from that kid, mm -hmm. it's what makes it come, come full circle.